and thank you for choosing to listen to Horse Heroes on Tour UK Edition. This is a podcast where Floor Schoonmarkers from EHS Communications talks to equestrian entrepreneurs and superstars in open-hearted, frank and honest one-on-one conversations. My name is Jack and I truly hope you enjoy listening to some amazing stories from the world of British and Irish equestrian. Put your feet up, relax and enjoy. Oh, well, we'll see. It's, um, and I always, it's an interview, we start with dilemmas. So first I ask you four dilemmas, you just answer one, one of them. In, in the normal podcast, when it's edited, it's, uh, there will be the intro tune. And then I do an introduction of you. And then we actually, we start with the interview and I normally always go back in time. Uh, yeah. Because of course a lot of people know your story already here, but I think yeah. of the Dutch listeners, not a lot of people know really. We all, always do where, why did people ever start working with horses? What's your background? Where did you come from? So a little the Sark story, which I heard on BBC, which was nice yeah, actually. Yeah. I listened to that. And uh, uh, so the our tunes, the Desert Island Disc. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I listened to it. That shows how old we are now. If you listen to Desert Island Disc, that's for like the older people. Yeah, you well, know, I was... You know, they have, like, between five and six million readers, uh, listeners on that. Oh, really? Five to six million. So that's why anyone says over here, if you get on Desert Island Disc, then you made it. You made it. Okay, if you put this on, then you can hear um, how well you speak in the mic. Oh, yeah, perfect. And then maybe you have to see if you have to switch it a bit higher. Yeah, that sounds fine. That sounds fine. Okay. Because this is, I'm used to do the podcast interviews. I'm not really that used to the to the camera yet. But I, we just wanted to see and try what happens. Apparently, yeah. after 30 minutes, that thing switches off. So then, so then I'll, I'll just turn it on again. Um, your phone is off as well. Yeah. Okay. And uh, is there anything you don't want to talk about or you don't want to talk about, you just don't talk about it? Okay. Yeah, but I mean, well, because you edit it anyway, so if you say something and I don't want to talk about it, we'll just say we're not talking about it. Yeah, then, no, but then yeah. leave it in. Then I'm like, okay, fine. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. I'm not having, I don't have any weird questions, but sometimes people say, well, I don't want to talk about ex-wives or something. <laughs> I don't have any of those. Okay, let's start then. Um, Vallejo or Utopia? Utopia. Texting or talking? Or texting. Peacock or cockatoo? Peacock. Would you rather be able to sing or dance? Dance. Yes. Okay, let's get started. Now, now, the, now is the intro tune uh, coming. And now I'm going to do your introduction. He was raised in the Channel Island of Saak. Ended up in England for a job with horses. He became the youngest British rider ever to compete in the Olympic Games. Won several medals at many shows and Olympic Games, including a gold team medal during the Olympic Games in London 2012, a bronze team medal in Rio 2016, and a fabulous silver team medal in Tokyo 2021. What he loves about riding is training, and his nickname is Granddad. Today I'm a guest at the stables of the fabulous Carl Hester. Hello, Carl. Good afternoon. It's lovely to have you here, Flora. I've seen you for many years no, at haven't. shows. Yep. At shows. So yeah, it's lovely shows. to have you here. It's <laughs> lovely to have you here at home. Yes, yeah, so good to, 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 to come here and to see it in real life, uh, how, you, how you live here and how you have your horses. Um, so this is the very first time for me to do uh, the Horse Heroes podcast with an English guest. And uh, you are the first one I'm having an interview with. What we normally always do is go back in time. So we start at the beginning of uh, Little Carl. Like, can you tell me where you grew up, where you came from? Yes, so my uh, mother had me when she was very young, when she was um, 16 years old. And, um, and I was, we were living in London and um, I had um, an illness, pneumonia, and that used to make me quite sick. And the, the doctor suggested uh, that my mum take me somewhere outside the city where the air would be better for me. And she had a godmother who lived on the island of Sark. And she had been, the godmother had been great friends, of course, with my grandmother. So she left this very small, it was a little wooden chalet that she lived in in Sark. And she left that to my mother and her two brothers. So um, 
at that age, they were all very young then. Her, my uh, two uncles as well were young. And so my mum was the only one that thought she would take the offer and go and live in Sark in the house, which was called Chez Nou. Uh, it's a very, you know, we're very close to France there. We could see with the French coast from, from, from the bedroom window, which was yeah. lovely. It's about 18 miles away. And um, it was a fantastic way to go and, you know, start life. Start, starting life in Sark is... You know, I still think today people would love to bring up their children there. There's no crime. You, you know, you go to the beach after school. Um, you know, you do a lot of practical things because you only have one teacher that teaches you everything. So, you know, the one teacher has to be able to teach you French, English, maths, science. Uh, you know, so we did a lot of practical things as well. That you How would many people live in Sark? Um, there was between about 550 and 600 people. And I looked it up where it is. And how do you travel if you live in Sark? I mean. <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, getting to Sark is like, you, you do cross a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, basically, from England, we fly to Guernsey. So that's one of the bigger islands. That's where I went to school, eventually. Uh, so you fly to Guernsey, and then you take a taxi from the airport down to the boat, and then you have a boat from Guernsey to Sark. Yeah. Then you arrive in Sark, and of course there are no cars. So then you have a tractor that takes all your bags up the hill for you because it's a very high island. So it's about 260 foot above sea level. So it's a big plateau island and to get to the top of it is quite a steep climb. So it's a bit of a shock if you've never been. So the first thing when you get there is you look up the cliffs and you think, I've got to get to the top. And then when you get to the top, then you can either take a bicycle or you can walk or you can take a horse and carriage to your hotel or your home or wherever you're staying. So you use a lot of transport, different types of transport, just to get to the island. And did you live there, just you and your mum, or did you have brothers and sisters in that time? No, there was just my mum and I, and um, I used to go to where she was uh, working as a chambermaid in a hotel. And so when I was, was still before I went to school, I would go to work with her in the day when she was working in the hotel. <clears throat> um, she met um, Jess Hester, who is was... My, uh, who adopted me yeah. uh, as his son. So they married, I think, when I was about six or seven years old. So, and then my mum went on to have two more children, my half-brother and sister, who were called Polly and Jessie. Uh, and uh, so we were raised as a family there together. And how long did you live in Sark? Well, I stayed there, I, I went to school there until I was 11 years old, and then at 11 years old I took an exam, which meant um, I could move to Guernsey to um, a state school. Mm -hmm. So I went to Guernsey, became a boarder, so I had to, but there, even though Sark was so close, it was only nine miles away, um, and I could see it across the sea, but we weren't allowed to travel backwards and forwards then, we had to live uh, on the island of Guernsey where I was at school. And Dad, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's I have it on pause. I have it on pause. I don't know where he is. <laughs> Honestly, well, that makes it real, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, she's... Charlotte's bought that as our, as my as our Christmas present. We'll put, it in, we'll put it in the side, shall we? Just shut the door, Bennett, and then I can... Now, where were we? Where were you in the story? You said something about you couldn't... You weren't allowed to travel up and down. You weren't allowed, yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, I'll no, start no, that yeah. bit again. Yeah. So... Oh. So we weren't allowed to travel, even though I could see the island of Sark. Um, we weren't allowed to travel backwards and forwards, so I had to stay at the school and be a boarder for all of term. So we just used to go home Christmas and Easter and summer holidays. Um, when I was 15 years old, I did my uh, O-levels, or GCSEs. Most people will probably know them, that's what they're called now. Yeah. And um, I always wanted to have a career in horses. I went back to Sark to work on the island. So I went back to work in a hotel. And so I worked in the bar at night. I ran the bar at night for the hotel. And then in the day, I was a carriage driver. So I used to go and collect guests from the boat and bring them to the hotel or do tours around the island. So that was actually your introduction with horses? Yeah. 
carriage driving. Yeah. So that was. Uh, so I actually have what what's called a carriage driving license. So <laughs> you know, it, most people probably that are listening will have a driving license yeah. to drive a car. I also now have that too. But when you live on an island like Sar, you also have to take uh, a license if you want to drive a tractor, and uh, a license if you want to drive a horse and carriage. But did your mum had anything with horses, or was it really you that... No, really me. I mean, my mum is... is I, I wouldn't say she didn't like horses, but she's frightened of horses. And my, oh. father, my father had no interest at all. I tried to make my brother and my sister, like, come and, you know, play with the horses with me when we were kids. Yeah. Uh, and they had a little bit of interest, but not, you know, not a passion for it. They just, you know, were young and enjoyed riding a little bit with me, but uh, they didn't have the passion. I mean, I wanted to ride anything I could ride there. We didn't have our own horse or pony there, so anything I could ride was always someone else's. Um, they were working horses, so yeah. these carriage driving horses, they weren't actual riding horses, but a lot of them, you know, were, were broken to ride. So they did actually manage to, um, yeah, to do, to do two jobs because the season in the Channel Islands is from March until September, and then the island closes down for the winter. So over the winter, none of the horses work. They just all on holiday. So they basically do six months on, six months off. Yeah. So at least I had a plenty of choice if I wanted to ride anything. But this was all without a saddle. This is all bare. Yeah, I would just want yeah. to ask you, like, did they have saddles? And uh, was there anything No, sport? not really. No. Um, no sport at all. Uh, there was a time when a riding school, they did try and open a riding school there, mm -hmm. which was, uh, you know, they bought uh, five or six ponies so that people could do some trekking around the island if they wanted to. So then I was like... You have saddles, you have bridles, oh, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is new. Uh, because we would very often ride with a head collar and just two ropes either side. But and where did you ride on that island? Because I've seen the pictures. Well, we mostly ride around the cliffs. So, you know, the cliff paths that go all the way around the island, you know, you can go and join and you can ride around them. And I mean, if you look at how it looks today, you would have a nervous breakdown yeah. about riding on them because, you know, you just think... But of course, you, everyone knows when you're young, you're fearless. Yeah. You don't think about danger. You don't think something's going to happen. Um, and we also used to take the horses right down to the bottom to swim them off the beaches. Oh, yeah. Which was great. It's, it's you know, and I always say, I'm pretty sure that I learned my balance by riding like that. Yes, without a saddle. I mean, I wasn't educated, but I did at least just learn to ride everything in a balance so that I could stay on. But then you were 15. Mm -hmm. I stayed there. Uh, I, I, I came to England for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and when you were 15? When I was 15. I left home, moved over here, and I moved to the New Forest uh, in the south of England. Yeah. And I met some people who had a holiday house on Sarg, and they actually had a centre in the New Forest called the Fortune Centre. And the Fortune Center actually was a center that rehabilitated um, physically and, men, you know, mental problems, um, disabilities, um, and they re helped rehabilitate them through horses. Oh, wow! Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's still a very famous center here in England today. It has a a big following. I mean, people realize how important horses can be for people with disabilities. Um, and, you know, so I, working alongside that, I also then did my um, qualifications for teaching. Mm -hmm. So I experienced everything there. I, they started, they said to me when, I, when they saw me ride, um, they, they said that they thought I could and did have some talent to be able to maybe be a competition rider. So they helped me with that. And then they helped me with, you know, like learning about how horses can help people yeah. and then also taking my exams as well. So I had a good round education for two and a half years. But you were still very young then when this all happened. Yeah, I, I mean, I was young, but you grow up quite quickly when yeah. you leave home. Yeah, of course. But then when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you, did you think of that no, on that island? No, I didn't think of that. I, I just presumed, like a lot of people that were there, that I would stay there for the rest of my life. And I would do what everybody does. And I would work with the tourists yeah. in tourism in the summer. And uh, I would find a job in the winter. And then I would do another summer. I mean, I did enjoy my life there. But I did also realise that when I started to get ambitious to be a rider... Uh, I knew I would have to leave the island and go somewhere. And that's exactly how my ambition came about. You know, coming to England, 
um, you know, they put me in the pony club to, you know, and I was on the dressage team, the eventing team and the show jumping team. So I did all three disciplines. Yeah. <laughs> and I suddenly, you know, it's like saddles and cleaning tack and mucking out and picking out feet and horses with shoes on and, yeah. you know, I had a lot, and clipping, you know, I mean, you know, we never, never, seen it before. <laughs> we never did any of that in Sark. Uh, shoes, yes, but I mean, clipping and things, never. No. Um, or grooming, really. We didn't really even groom them either. You just got on and rode. And, and jumped into yeah, a seat. Yeah, and they were, exactly. <laughs> they were they clean. Were clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, very, very different. And um, I, I enjoyed getting that education for two and a half years there. And then I went back to Sark again. Because you do get very homesick for when you come from a place. And my friends were there. And the lifestyle is so good there. So I did feel for a while then I had enough of England. And I went back to live on Sark again. Mm-hmm. But my grandmother was a very dominant lady and she was living there and she had already like seen that I had done my two and a half years here and I had some qualifications and she just said, look, you are not staying here. You are going back to England and you need to start looking for a job. Oh, really? Yeah. So everyone will, of course, have heard of The Horse and Hound. It's one of our most famous, you know, the most famous magazine for horses in England. And, of course, made famous on the film with Hugh Grant when yeah. he went in. Is it Love Actually? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or Notting Hill. Notting, Notting Hill. Hill. That's where it was. Everyone remembers Horse and Hound. So in the back of Horse and Hound, there always used to be a list of adverts, mm-hmm. um, you know, for jobs. And I saw this very small advert, and it just said, uh, Groom Rider Wanted for a Private Yard. So you got that magazine yeah. in Sark? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, well, you grandma week, made sure of that. <laughs> a week later than everyone else, of course. <laughs> yeah. Because it had to get there. Um, and anyway, I saw this job and I telephoned and and uh, the lady, she was called Jenny Taylor and her husband Christopher and they had a very small yard in the Cotswolds. Uh, and they used to buy a lot of ex-race horses and we would um, turn them around, event them, and then they would be sold. And she had already sold three horses from the yard that went on to be Olympic horses. So she had a very good eye for picking horses. And we only had seven stables. One of the stables was in the garden. One of the stables was a garage <laughs> that the car used to be in. Uh, it was a, not a, like a smart posh yard, but they were very good horsemen. Yeah. And I really learned some amazing things and, and, and really, you know, how to like deal with difficult horses there. So I stayed with them um, for, uh, for three years. And your, and your family, your, your mom and your brother and your sister and, and your dad, they all stayed. They stayed on Sark, yeah. They're still in Sark. Uh, my mother has uh, now moved. She now lives in South Africa, but my father still lives there. Uh, my brother and sister moved away as well because they also, you know, became ambitious in the fields that they do, you know, yeah. the work that they do. That It's not with horses, but, you know, my brother also now is, uh, has his business in South Africa and uh, my sister lives uh, over here. Okay. In the UK. So um, my father's still there. My grandmother stayed there until her death. Uh, and my uncle still lives there, my mum's brother. He, he moved over there as well to live. So I still have my connections there. And I still, you know, go back when I can. So, so um, it's a holiday place. Yeah, I mean, you have friends for life there, you yeah. know, when you grow up in a place like that. I mean, they might be the same age as me. We might have not seen each other sometimes for like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in some cases. Yeah. Um, but they're still, we all keep in touch. And... And I know, you know, that they are very proud of, you know, what, what I've done. Doing, yeah. And my post box is there because everybody that won a, a yeah, gold yeah, medal. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, everyone that won a gold medal in London Olympics got a gold post box to, yeah. the ta- to where they came from. So Sark has a gold post box, which uh, <laughs> you know, is the only post box on the island. So a lot of people come and, and have a picture of it. And the comes in there a week uh, later with all your results in it. <laughs> so you can still follow exactly. you. Exactly, <laughs> of course. Okay, but so then what happened after your, uh, the, when you went to these people, where, where they had the stables everywhere in the yard and in the garage? Well, I learned to event, and I yeah. was an event rider, and I loved that. And we kept produ- we were producing horses, and I was the rider, and then we would get results, and then the horses would be sold. And, and it was just, a, as I said, a great way of learning techniques, of learning how to deal with difficult horses, and... And obviously giving them another life. You know, sometimes these horses would come from the sales, the racing sales, where they were completely uneducated. Oh. Um, and they were difficult. Yeah. But, they, you know, there's a big thing over here now. It's called retraining of racehorses. And it has a very big following here in the UK. You know, people realize now that thoroughbreds can be great for everything. But, of course, they're not so easy just for dressage. Um, but they are great for lots of other disciplines. So 
I, st I did that, and then <clears throat> I was offered, uh, I had a chance of riding a young rider horse and that belonged to uh, Nicky Barrett. Yeah. And he, he was called Slightly Trendy, and he was a great big Irish cross thoroughbred horse, and Nicky had been on the European Championships with him, mm. and um, she had, um, at the time, she, uh, he was owned with her and her grandmother, and they had a fallout. So her grandmother said to me, would I ride it? So I rang Nikki and I, because Nikki and I had been friends since we were, you know, we met sort of when I first came to England. She was one of the first people I met. So Nikki said, no, you ride it. That's fine. And I did ride him for the season and I made it to the selection and I was picked to go to the European Championships, which were in Serbia, Italy. And this was back in like 1988, I think that was. Yeah. And, um... And so we finished the selection, and you're on the team. You can, and so uh, Nikki's granny, Granny Craddock, said to me, "You can go home for the weekend, and then you come back next week, and then we prepare and go to Italy." So I went home for the weekend, got on one of my event horses. I was cantering across the field, and it fell over on top of me. Oh my god! And, and broke my leg. It. Yeah, broke my leg. <laughs> oh, no. So that was the end of my. That was the only dressage I had, uh, you, you know, like really started to get some success on. I had been a, a young rider champion, mm -hmm. but in 1985, when I was young rider champion, and this was on a coloured horse, a brown and white oh, name, yeah? Jolly Dolly, she was called. <laughs> and, um, and you didn't even have to do a flying change. So in 1985, I was young rider champion, just doing, you know, low level, you know, that, but you were still young rider champion, just doing medium level tests, half past each way and trying and to cancel. And on a coloured horse. On a coloured horse. Jolly so, Dolly. Yeah, Jolly Dolly. And she was, yeah, she was a, she was a fun, fun, an all-rounder. Yeah. So those had been my sort of like early dressage career highlights. Yeah. And because of my young rider team selection, I was then offered the job uh, with Dr. Bechtel Simer. Yeah. Uh, asked me to come for an interview. And, um, but how old were you then? I must have been 21 then because I was on the team um, the following year. I'd have been 22 maybe then. Uh, I know I, I think I rode at the World Championships when I was 22. Anki was there at that time yeah. as well. I remember Anki and I standing next to each other in the lineup. So at the World Championships in 1990. So I went to work at the Dr. Bechtel Simon in 1989 in October mm -hmm. and the following June. I, get, I made it, I'd never done Grand Prix, but I did a few Grand Prix at the beginning of the year, was selected, and we arrived at the World Championships in uh, Stockholm. Yeah, wow. I didn't know anybody, I, did it and I hadn't been really competing internationally, so all of these people were like, strange to me, but how, <laughs> how it, not strange, but I just didn't know. But who, who were the riders then? Christina Stuckelberger, um, Linsenhoff, um... Monica Tiedereski was riding then yeah. on the team. Kira yeah, was just yeah. winning her first medals with Matador then. And we had a warm-up before the Grand Prix, and they used the Intermediaire 2 as a warm-up. Mm -hmm. We don't have that anymore, but mm -hmm. every championship in those days, you would have a warm-up. 